National Research Council says there is no such evidence, and that is that. Independence. The thing that really differentiates our reports is independence. Today, the National Research Council released a report on preventing these kinds of airborne crises. It's a, really important to us that we don't put out any report that is really beneath the quality standards of the institution. A report from the National Research Council recommends a mandatory window label. We've heard members of Congress say really the Academy is the only game in town now, the only place they can go to get an independent objective evaluation of an, in, an issue. After seven years of heated debate over breast implants, one of the most prestigious scientific bodies in the world has concluded... We could find no definitive evidence linking breast implants to cancer. What we do well is to bring together the best in the scientific community nationally and internationally to do essentially a state of the science assessment on whatever subject we're being asked to speak to. The Academy's reputation for producing objective, high-quality reports is its most critical asset. Members are insulated from politics and special interests, so the best scientific judgments can be made. This video is about that evolving process, a process that has provided the intellectual architecture for public policy decisions for over 100 years. We are working on real-time issues that make a difference in people's lives, whether it's you know, food safety or toxic waste or terrorism or immigration or child welfare. These are front page issues that we can bring the best science to. A critical part of the process is the selection of those people who will serve on the committee. Well, good morning. I'm Mike Doyle. It's essential to have the right leadership of a committee and the right membership who represent the spectrum of expertise that bears on the question being asked. The first order of business is, I think, to understand the task and what is exactly the audience that they're trying to reach. This committee is looking at a risk assessment that's been done by uh, the United States Department of Agriculture on a microbial pathogen called E. coli 0157H7. It takes study director David Butler about okay. four months to prepare for this meeting. In consultation with the chair, he plans a timeline for the study from beginning through report review, and with help from his staff, puts together the initial briefing book. Let's check out the briefing book. Much time has also been spent looking for the right mix of scientific expertise and experience in assessments and statistical analysis required to meet the charge. We have a very balanced committee. Uh, we have uh, epidemiologists, food microbiologists, uh, veterinarians, infectious disease experts, as well as risk assessors. And we need that kind of expertise because there's all different facets to a risk assessment. This committee comprises experts who not only have the time to volunteer, but are free of conflicts of interest that might hinder their performance. During committee selection, personal and professional experience is examined from day one. And it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Institute. Uh, and yet again during the conflict and bias discussion that opens the first meeting. This morning we're going to go around the table and essentially have you introduce yourselves to each other and to us and in the process of that introduction to talk to us about your experiences, your professional and personal financial or other ties that might be relevant to this activity uh, and also what perspectives you bring. The first meeting allows committee members to get to know one another and more importantly to become fully acquainted with the charge. Now this time, I'd like to present the charge to the committee and give you a little bit of background. Uh, we were given a very specific task by our sponsor and in general terms, the way to go about answering that charge. The sponsor's charge is the central organizing principle of a report. The charge lays out the questions that need to be answered, and in so doing affects committee selection, data gathering, as well as how the study itself is designed. 
but the charge is often stated in broad terms, and the committee must agree early on about the parameters of its mission. There just are not enough meetings, uh, enough meeting time for, for one to flounder. And so you have to know where you're going immediately at that first meeting and, and uh, continue with that charge in mind as you move ahead. As it moves ahead, the committee also needs to keep in mind the set of report review guidelines that have been handed out. Ultimately, its work will be formally reviewed, critiqued as to how well it meets the charge, whether its findings and recommendations are evidence-based, and how sensitive it is to policy issues. At this stage in the process, my greatest concerns are making sure that uh, committee members follow through on uh, their writing assignments, that we have the information we need uh, to do a good job, and that everything can get accomplished in the time period that's been set aside for that study. By the end of the first meeting, a general timeline for the study will be agreed upon, and specific writing responsibilities assigned. According to plan, the committee has eight months to complete its report. Uh, we have uh, scheduled uh, two more meetings, and uh, we have to use that time very, very effectively because that's not a lot of time, but a lot to do. When a committee prepares its report, its responsibility is to be sure that the findings and conclusions are based on sound science. I mean, how many hours of hearing time would be involved in a typical opposition proceeding? I'm co-chairing a committee that's focused on uh, the changes in intellectual property law over the past 20 years and how uh, they might have affected the incentives for industrial innovation. This is an unusual study in its data collection because we concluded at the very outset uh, that there was very little research that had been done that would l help us answer these general questions about the relationship of intellectual property to innovation. Rather than try to address every aspect of intellectual property law, the committee has focused on the impact of the U.S. patent system. But with little data available in the literature, the research agenda is discussed and adopted. We had a number of experts on the committee. I think within the group were enough people from, um, uh, in our case, from legal profession, from academic uh, economists, from uh, industrial representatives that we were, I think, able to do a pretty good job figuring out what, where w would we be likely to get evidence that would be helpful to us. The purpose of this session is to, to consider whether in making our own recommendations for changes in the U.S. system, we want to adopt features that are uh, uh, prominent parts of other systems. A series of conferences are held to gather evidence firsthand from the various stakeholders in the arena. Experts testify. I mean, would you have any advice about how uh, the process could be streamlined? Are there... A website is designed to facilitate interchange with a committee and a dozen small-scale empirical studies are commissioned to be presented and eventually published. And we want to make sure that we look in some detail at particular sectors, not just overall, the overall economy. So we have commissioned work on biotechnology, patenting and licensing. We worked, we've commissioned work on, on software, patenting and licensing. Uh, we've commissioned some work on internet patents. But as the data gathering continues, it's a challenge to keep the committee on track. Members whose expertise isn't central to the committee's focus sometimes feel underutilized, and the study director and the chair need to be sensitive to the group dynamics at play. I spend a lot of time with, uh, with committee members whose, whose views, I think, are not getting sufficient attention and encouraging them to take a more active, forceful role. An important aspect of the job is to try to keep the, the committee uh, uh, not just civil, but functioning well uh, as a working group, even though you know, there often are widely divergent points of view. Those divergent points of view often begin to converge as the committee weighs the evidence and formulates possible recommendations. Under discussion, eight to ten different areas where the committee could offer guidance. The committee already in its discussions has coalesced around a couple of recommendations uh, that are probably 
uh, constructive, worthwhile, and might actually have a chance of being accepted. So I feel pretty good about it. It's better if we can get consensus, but if there's true, um, if truly an inability to reach consensus, it's better to, to expose that than to have a weak report that everybody can agree on. The background material is in pretty good shape. That's the judgment of the committee. Uh, the, the more uh, meaty part of the report, which will deal with the alternatives and the recommendations, uh, are being hashed out today. If I was to sit here and look at the role of this panel, in my mind, the panel should be explaining types of peer, re peer reviews and the spectrum of peer reviews from a simple to a complex. As the committee works on early drafts of its report, the debate continues over which Army Corps of Engineer projects should be peer reviewed and to what degree. But I do think that what we're talking about at the moment are a number of issues that need to be carefully pointed out that, that indicate why the core projects are, are, are difficult. Concern over core projects, the way some were selected and administered in the past, prompted Congress to mandate this report. The underlying objective is to use peer reviews to bring greater credibility to the Corps' process. The question is, how? The panel will consider the timing of peer review in the core planning and will provide advice on implementing recommendations. Doesn't Even at this stage, members revisit the task statement included in their briefing book with little time to waste the committee focuses on refining the report's approach in order to reach consensus on the recommendations. I will frequently send, uh, say, electronic files of, of, the, of the draft report to a committee before I prepare the notebook, and just to tell them this is, this is, this is what I think you've said, and this is what, what, what I, I believe you've all contributed. Do I have it right? There is a give and take in the process, and the strategy is to find ways to resolve those conflicts uh, without, give, without violating your basic principles. Rather than suppress opposition, the committee chair and study director encourage members as parts of subgroups, as well as in full committee, to state their views, sometimes in writing. Committee members who, who may be outside, outside the rest of the committee, when they write, their, when they write down their, their views, their, their the rest of the committee can see it, can comment on that, and I think through the, through the meetings, those views or differences of opinion start to decrease. As the committee approaches its final meeting, the chair and study director work closely on the report, looking for weaknesses in the arguments and recommendations, right. anticipating okay. criticisms that may come up in report review. Having a good working relationship with the study director is probably the most important uh, uh, ingredient of a successful study because uh, they are the ones who who make it all happen they're the ones who put it together in the end but first the committee will meet one last time to lay out the chapters flesh out details and agree on the reports findings and recommendations then with some help from the staff a document written by a committee of 11 will begin to speak in one voice the committee has done, has done a terrific job over the past, past month in, in producing uh, a good amount of text as well as a lot of figures and illustrations that, uh, that are going to be very useful. We've got all the chapters laid out. We've got a draft summary. Uh, I, I think we're, we're in good shape uh, as we're going toward review. An enormous amount of effort goes into producing all Academy reports from selecting the committees to disseminating the results. But it can all too easily be compromised if during the deliberative process or report review, there's a leak to the press. When there are leaks of, of draft reports, then it, uh, the, the public and sponsors are confused. You know, is the Academy standing by what's said in the draft report, in the final report? Why was this changed? Why was that changed? When the committee process is violated, unnecessary controversy ensues, and it's the Academy's reputation for objectivity and independence that's questioned. 
the, the Academy's reputation for being objective and high quality is absolutely critical to the way our reports are received. Uh, the Academy's reputation is really the, our, our most important asset. When I was on the study director's side, my biggest nightmare was that the report would be out and somebody would say, this is all wrong, you know, and they were right. Um, and so one of the real benefits of the report review process is, first of all, a strong review can help you catch any mistakes. The last phase in the deliberative process, report review, is designed to assist the committee in making its document as accurate and effective as possible. It's accomplished with the help of a panel of external reviewers and the assistance of a coordinator and monitor who make sure the committee responds properly to the criticisms that arise. The review process, in fact, uh, casts an even wider net in terms of diversity and balance of experience and academic credentials than does the original composition of the committee. But with the Academy producing over 200 reports a year, it's no surprise that best case scenario doesn't always play out. The formal review process takes weeks, but can last much longer if a report is submitted too hastily and in poor editorial condition. Most serious problem is where a committee has really gotten together around a particular point of view in which they may believe passionately and they believe it so passionately that it may be self-evident to them and the actual structural basis of the argument in the report may be very inadequate to prove that point. To prove its case, a report must address the questions that were asked with factual support and coherent arguments, but also with adequate statistical and often economic analysis. The committee must be careful that its numbers add up and that it's considered the impact of its own recommendations. Reports with unsubstantiated recommendations are hollow for users who have to be able to defend those recommendations. But to be most persuasive, a report must also be crafted in a way that's understandable to its audience, many of whom, at least in the policy arena, may only read the first 15 to 20 pages. Often policymakers will uh, ignore the, the rest of the body of the report and read only the executive summary. So one of the questions we ask in review is how effective that executive summary is. The executive summary needs to provide a snapshot of the committee's report, conveying important policy guidance in a terse, comprehensible way. Reviewers will look carefully at all of these criteria, and the better the committee meets them going into review, the easier the process will be for everyone. To be sure, almost every report is improved in the process of report review, but the better it goes in, guaranteed, the better it'll come out. I'm always surprised that so many busy and important and skillful people in this country are greatly in demand, except to be a volunteer on one of our committees. One per thousand is... According to the National Research Council report, the shuttle's onboard computers have gone into orbit with eight so-called Severity One errors. Everybody seeks in Washington to have a role in public policy, and, and this institution is a really great place to do that. A new study has found that almost two million adults and one million teenagers are pathological gamblers. The study by the National Research Council called... Seeing people come together and, and seeing people who would never work together, say, uh, a civil engineer and a public policy specialist who may have little in common, little reason to work together. They're put on the same committee. They get to know each other. They learn a little bit from each other. The NAS is expected to finish its investigation next year. The people that you're able to meet and associate with who bring so many neat ideas and diverse skills to bear on whatever you're working on. I know that people do this because they, they believe in science, they believe in the institution, and they then believe in they doing something for the common good of the nation. And I just want to emphasize that we all very much appreciate what you do.